Welcome to Slash Forward. I hope you're not squeamish because we're about to step into the last big budget zombie film from George Romero's universe. They gave him some money and he clearly spent it on practical effects because these zombies have developed the ability to think for themselves and work toward a common goal. That goal? Take down the city of Fiddler's Green and eat the sweet, sweet flesh of her citizens residing within, in repayment of their constant harassment of the local zombie population, of course. Which scourge will be eradicated? We're going going to take a look right now. Let's get to it. We opened some time ago, likely at the beginning of Dawn of the Dead, but in a different location, we presume, based on what we hear from the narrating voice of the radio disc jockey. And then we come to now, after all that other stuff, and find the city is full of a population now primarily comprised of zombies. They amble about in the blue light of morning, depressed about the noticeable lack of fresh meat available to them. Through Riley's conversation, we learn that they have settled into a habit of repeating old activities, and even seem to communicate through a rudimentary sort of language. We find that Riley and Charlie were navigating this harsh new world, overrun by scavengers and bikers, to see if this town might contain any valuable supplies. Once affirmed, they love popping off fireworks, which they call skyflowers because language has been lost. Then you know it's go time when Cholo rolls up. Hey, Riley, looks like God's let the phone off the hook, huh, baby? No, for sure. But Riley's hesitant to proceed due to their enemy's new sentience. Even a mob of idiot zombies could be dangerous. Look at dumb dumb Charlie over here. Even he has some usefulness. But the two alphas are making their last ride out before retiring, so they gotta go. So, under cover of Skyflower, which which these dim bulbs can't stop gawking at, the riders ride for supplies and glory. But while out and about, they have their fun as well. Big Daddy grows despondent over all of this wasted zombie unlife, while the boys gather up all the food and meds they can find. But right in the middle of all this, the sky flowers stop blooming, the result of a jam on the dead reckoning that creates a gravely dangerous situation for them. The party bus sweeps the streets to cover their escape, but old Cholo has a taste for the wild turkey, so they make a pit stop at the package store. He breaks the cardinal rule of always expecting a zombie in the icebox. Fortunately, this is easy work for Cholo. Unfortunately, his disrespectful means of shopping for cigars costs young Mike his life. Riley arrives after the fact and is really upset about it, even though he didn't see the part where Cholo made it happen. He then calls a ceasefire so they can all safely roam the streets on their way back. And all their hot dogging results in Big D acquiring a firearm. Back at the warehouse, they unload the hall and return to Fiddler's Green, a secure community surrounded on three sides by rivers. They have a brief disagreement about the need and value of celebration, with Jolo affirming the contention as he believes this trip was his ticket inside the Lux condominiums typically reserved for better people than them. So he checks in and slides through the crowds of consumers while Riley turns in his tag and leaves the comforts of society behind for good. As he meets up with his old anti-establishment friend Mulligan, we learn via some new recruits that the town has only one access point that is heavily guarded, as is demonstrated by a single wandering zombie. As Cholo arrives at Kaufman's penthouse, a disturbance draws him to the neighbor's flat. A brief investigation reveals a possible self-inflicted mortality. He tries to help the poor woman understand the significance of what's to be done. While this ignorant twat tries to cut down his father, and gets bit. Cholo takes care of half the job and leaves the rest for security. When Riley gets to the garage, he finds the car he had paid and arranged for is now missing, absconded with by some young scumbag to be sure. This forces him to visit the seedy underbelly of this new society to have a chit chat with Chihuahua. As he makes his desires for a car known, the savages induce a zombie cockfight via the unwilling participation of a resourceful young woman. Slack holds her own for a time, but there's nowhere to go. So Riley comes through with a couple of headshots that cause a stampede and gunfight in which Chihuahua gets capped. Charlie shows his worth, giving his trusty sight a little lickety lick before using his good eye to draw a bead and put that conniving bitch down for good. They then only have a few seconds for introductions before security shows up to arrest them for loitering. In their cells, we learn Kaufman's responsible for Slack's situation. It's a punishment for stepping out and providing assistance to Mulligan. But all this political bullshit is too much. It's the same everywhere there are people, which is why Riley aims to head to where there are no folks. 
In a complete negation of his desires, they elect to join him, especially now that Mulligan has fallen. Elsewhere, the Deester works to grow his zombie battalion, find a home base from which to launch their attack, teach them how to act autonomously toward a common goal, and help them appreciate the beauty of a city skyline framed by moonlight. Jolo finally catches up with the boss man, where he gets definitive confirmation that despite saving up a sizable deposit and pairing that up with an unconditional willingness to suck off Mr. Kaufman's ego, his kind is not welcomed in their community. Devastated, Cholo goes on the defensive and flexes his muscle a bit, threatening to leverage his knowledge of what goes on behind the scenes against Mr. K. In response, he makes his intentions perfectly clear. I won't be needing this man anymore. But Cholo is from the streets, and he easily avoids this situation. Then he picks up Foxy and Mouse to initiate the backup plan. They reach the outer perimeter at dark and attempt to check out a truck, but his papers are not current. He doesn't even have to think up a lie, though, because the first wave of the new zombie wars commence right there and provides cover for their larceny. Their primary focus is escaping rather than helping the soldiers, so they casually roll out as the outer wall is taken. The invading forces only rest momentarily for snacking, so as to fuel up for the battles to come. Once outside, Cholo demands Kaufman put $5 million on a boat and send her across the river, because even outside the city, cash is king. Rather than pay him, Kaufman summons Riley to retrieve the Dead Reckoning, a war vehicle of his design, and in return, he will be provided a car and his freedom. Out at the dock, Mouse is left behind to collect their earnings. He skateboards over to a cozy little boathouse to patiently await their ransom. Meanwhile, in the locker room, there's a bit of dick wagging before our group is joined by Manolette, Motown, and Pillsbury. Soon, this band of misfits is wading through the aftermath of the earlier altercation. Seeing what they're capable of, Riley gives them a warning about their enemy's newfound capacity to work cooperatively. While prepping the vehicle, Charlie silently sets up and sharpshoots a zombie at close range. Meanwhile, while collecting ammo from the armory, they find a full-on Thanksgiving dinner underway. After putting them down, they all group up, and right before they leave, Manolette is bitten in a very humorous mode. They go ahead and bring him along, and also make sure he's both aware and actively paying attention when they help prevent the indignity of turning into an animated rotting corpse. We then find out that Foxy does, indeed, have some apprehensions about whether or not they're going to get paid, and Cholo reassures him after he finishes is getting a fine pump in his lats. But back at the Greens, we see that Kaufman's talking with his board about transferring to a new location. Out on the road, we see that Riley outfitted his precious war machine with a homing device. Once they get well out into no man's land, he hops out to explain his plan to never return, along with his desire to proceed in a vehicle that has a roof. That means he's hopping in the reckoning and taking her deep so they can get on board or go their own way. They opt to stick with the plan for now. Meanwhile, Cholo notices the time right as he gets the bad news about the distinct lack of money present on the docks. So they start loading some shells while Mouse engages in a little overkill on a passing zombie. This action makes him very susceptible to being eaten by the remaining zombies enjoying the boardwalk, many of whom came here to line up in preparation for a polar plunge across the river. So while Cholo loads up the rockets and Slack takes a shortcut up the side of the mountain, Big Daddy shows them all that you don't actually have to know how to swim if you also do not need to breathe, so that's a little tip for you. The whole crew makes it across and slowly emerges on the other side like Navy SEALs. As they do so, we observe the quiet, content scuzz bags of the city enjoy their last moments of bliss before the streets are completely overrun. Meanwhile, the crew reaches the launch point while they're preparing to blast Fiddler's Green off the map. Pillsbury and Motown hatch a plan that involves him caving her face in for some reason, before he and Slack take up the flank position. Riley confronts the dead reckoning and is led in through the side door. They feel each other out a bit and, after getting comfortable, begin aiming in on the greens, which are unexpectedly, to them, being overrun at that moment by a horde of zombies under the careful tutelage of Big Daddy. Midnight comes without the appearance of five million dollars, because, of course, they're not at the drop-off spot. Nonetheless, Cholo begins initiation procedures, which are halted when Riley uses his homing tracker to lock the rockets. It's a double cross for a good cause, as he then saves Cholo from a headshot while also saving the citizens of Fiddler's Green. Then they carefully take control while Momo and some of her zombie friends are taken care of. They call Kaufman to reveal the city is 
safe right after he mercy killed one of his boys, so that's a little embarrassing. But then the city happens to be exploding on its own. Now on separate paths, Cholo and Foxy go off on their own, so Riley can circle back and try to help the innocent citizens. The city has erupted into chaos, as the zombies make more zombies and the guards abandon the citizens, leaving them defenseless. They try to find a good way in while the city continues to fall and the zombies feast. They ultimately settle on circling around to an unguarded drawbridge. Out in the old town, Cholo and Foxy don't get very far before Cholo gets bit, which is really too bad. But you know, he's kind of curious about what it's like. So he's left by Foxy and eventually makes it back to the outer train station. Now back in the new town, we see the zombies trudging along and picking up any enemy weapons they can find. They pause briefly to make a wish before heading to the interior of the greens. Here, the soft citizens flee from the oncoming horde, the horrors of which have been unseen by their virgin eyes for many years. Meanwhile, the dead reckoning makes it to the bridge and Slack gets a quick lesson on piloting this beast. It's just like a video game. Oh yeah, what kind? Riley works to get the bridge lowered as the others are quietly surrounded by their enemies, which keeps them occupied and leaves Riley to solve his own problems. With the door blocked, he's forced to hoist himself atop the old girl and then they mow down the obstacles in various ways. At the skirts of town, the survivors reach the electric fence. Finding it active, they resort to Plan B, which involves cowering in the face of danger and demonstrating why these last vestiges of humanity are not worth saving, and are unlikely to be saved as the zombies' new intelligence allows them the luxury of disregarding sky flowers in favor of partaking in their favorite pastime, massacring humans. Kaufman, indignant that the dirties would breach his pristine phallus, takes a few pot shots on his way to the garage, where he is left left by his driver at the first sign of trouble. Luckily, zombies still can't open doors, but Big Daddy was a mechanic, so he does know how to refuel automobiles, but he quickly tires of this and shambles off on his own. Special K gets out to check on his cash and find the spare keys but is confronted by Cholo. Unfortunately for him, he comes to discover that the Cholster was dead before he killed him. As they struggle to bite and avoid being bit, it's revealed that BD only left to find one of those combustible pots they usually have laying around, which he rolls down the ramp to blow them boys. By the time the wrecking crew arrives to take down the fences, they come to recognize that being out of town was the best place to be, both then and in the future. Out of respect for their fallen comrades, they conduct a Viking funeral on their asses to wipe out what remains. But then, by virtue of creating a safe space, like a flower sprouting from a crack in the sidewalk, a ragtag group of citizens emerge. In the aftermath, we see that Mulligan made it out and has resolved to rebuild the town. But for everyone, still desiring to find solitude, the main crew heads for the open wilderness of Canada. Even the now sentient zombies are able to revel in the satisfaction of a job well done. Due to their recent obsolescence, the pilots of the Dead Reckoning fire off their stockpile of sky flowers as they move along. This one was somewhat confounding. It feels like a movie that throws out common action movie tropes in the hope we'll just go along with it, but then makes the ever-present background threat zombie-themed. It really felt like a big dumb action movie at heart. Fiddler's Green is a safe and secure community in which the ruling class, who live in the upper floors of the swanky high-rise condominiums, enjoy leisure and consumer excess while the dregs below get to wallow in their vices and petty desires while earning a few pence. Kaufman was the leader of the facility. He stepped up to provide leadership and was the one who came up with the idea to provide the unwashed masses with games, gambling, prostitution, and everything else in order to keep them happy and unaware. While it does seem like there was room for everyone inside the building. They did need folks who were willing to do the shit jobs to help keep things running. Riley and Cholo and their group were probably at the upper end of that lower hierarchy. Their job was to go out and roam the wastelands to find supplies they could bring back and provide to the upper class, a task they were generously compensated for. However, regardless of one's ambition or accrued wealth, this civilization was set up more as a caste system that did not allow upward mobility beyond a certain point. For some reason, the main lubricator of this economic machine was US currency. It's not clear why that would be the case. Cholo's retirement plan was to buy his way in with the upper crust and live his life enjoying their excess. Failing that, he intended to steal the dead reckoning and use it to hold the city for ransom. Kaufman refused to negotiate with terrorists, and as a consequence for not paying, Cholo intended to rocket the city. This was despite the fact that doing so would change nothing. Many innocent people would die, he would still be out in the open with the dead reckoning, and he would have no additional cash to show for it. There was very little motivation here outside of the thin motivations they began with. I mean, how was he going to use cash outside the city? 
Who is going to accept it? This was a very trope-driven plot, which raised many questions, almost too many to ask and certainly more than there are answers for. Monica, aka Motown, gave her boy Pillsbury a little look like she had something up her sleeve, which he reciprocated right before cold cocking her. What unspoken plan could they possibly have had that would require her to take some brain damage? And when she woke up, how would she know where to go or what to do? She was in the nether realm when they walked off in one of many possible directions. What's up with giving vehicles names? This other vehicle they used has a name as well that I forget now. But when Cholo first threatened Kaufman, he said that he had dead reckoning. And I just thought he was saying that he could aim really well. But he was talking about a vehicle. This makes it feel like the script was co-written by a 13-year-old. On the subject of names, why was John Leguizamo's character named Cholo? And Phil Fondakiro's character named Chihuahua? I understand from a practical perspective, but wouldn't that be like saying Mr. Kaufman's name was Bad Guy, only with a more demeaning undertone to it? And what's up with Scavenger Retirement? They seem like fairly capable and intelligent citizens. Couldn't Kaufman have come up with something more engaging to do that would have engendered an environment of professional development and continuous improvement? Riley engineered the Dead Reckoning. You are wasting his talents on reconnaissance missions. Also, they fire off their fireworks at the end, but wouldn't they still need Skyflower? They set it up as a plot point the zombies are reverting back to old habits and gaining intelligence. But they also said most other civilizations had fallen, and they were specifically trying to go where there were no other people. Most zombies were swaying in the breeze, only demonstrating they could think when presented with the opportunity, which was instigated by the tension of human versus zombie conflict. If they were going to where there are no humans, and they don't have the tendency to kill every zombie they see as a leisure activity, wouldn't it stand to reason that the zombies they run across will be more like traditional zombies, making the sky flowers very useful? Finally, what year is it? I was trying to get a look at Mike's tag, but couldn't quite make it out. Slack makes reference to never having left the city. It wasn't clear if she meant the city proper from before the fall, or just the Fiddler's Green portion that came after the apocalypse. In either case, did they still have video games? Folks were gambling and whoring fairly regularly, but were they also losing themselves in land parties? If not, I'm not sure Pretty Boy's reference would have landed, and also, she's probably not older than Slack, so I can't imagine her pre-apocalyptic experiences are much more varied. Despite all that, this was a fun movie. The next couple to come for Romero were lower budget and definitely leveraged some mediocre CGI to provide the visual effects. This one has some pretty plentiful and physically present and gore effects throughout. In any situation where there was zombie-human contact, they did not skimp out on showing us what our new sentient buddies were up to. They kept things interesting. Also, I think this is likely the best late Romero you're gonna get to see. Things take a decidedly steep decline hereafter, both in terms of budget and in terms of general plotting and acting. It's not fantastic, but I see why people like it, and it does try to bring something new to the genre. But then, if you start out with traditional tropes, and Romero was the progenitor of those tropes, and then try to split off in a completely new direction, that may be a good indicator that you've exhausted your meaningful time in that universe. The Walking Dead came much later and still had an effective presentation of slow zombies over a very long story period. You don't have to do something new to try to make it fresh, because the story will carry it through if it's good enough. It doesn't all sound positive. But despite that, I think this film represents somewhat of a torch passing from the godfather of zombies to the creative community at large. It feels like an attempt to enter into the newest phase of this genre at the time and make a final imprint before taking on his last few low-budget projects that didn't even attempt to add anything particularly new. For that reason, I think this one's worth watching. It has some great actors in it, has really ramped up the gore and practical effects, and is a nice cap-off to the modern era of Romero-style theater release budget zombie movies. Now that we're here, I wanted to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video, and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. A website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.